Members of the Meremburra and Yarry Lake Landcare Group have recognised that some of the cereal varieties that they are growing in their cropping country are showing signs of decreasing yields and lower establishment rates as a result of the sodic soil conditions. In order to maintain cropping as part of their enterprise operations, they are needing to adapt and look at varieties more suited to these soil conditions. There has been significant research and breeding undertaken locally through Australian Grain Technologies based at Narrabri. They invited Dr Meeching Liu, plant breeder, University of Sydney Plant Breeding Institute, AGT and Douglas Lash, Variety Support Manager, Northern New South Wales and Queensland, AGT Breeding Proprietary Limited to address members at a recent seminar. This seminar is supported by Northwest Local Land Services through funding from the Australian Government. So Rob, the uh, chair of the Yarry Lake Landcare Group, contacted you to, uh, to see whether you'd be interested in coming and sharing some of the, the research on some of the varieties that are being um, trialled for sodic conditions. What's been the benefit from your perspective as a researcher to coming along here today and hearing some of the feedback and questions from the landholders? Uh, um, the, I, as a breeder, uh, my goal is uh, always trying to work for the farmers and I always try to collect all the information, feedback from the farmers to, to tell me, the growers, to tell me what they need. Okay, so, so backgrounding of it, you know, like yeah, looking so, at the soils the other day. Yeah, look at the soils and look at the environment and look at the uh, requirement um, for the people for uh, what what kind of variety they want. Okay. And that is really important for and, me. And noticing that we're mixed farmers as well. We have yeah. some cattle and some yeah. some grain crops and some forage crops. And, mm. and, and it helps to uh, delect uh, my breeding activities yeah. definitely and also and for me like I um, have an opportunity to come here to tell the growers what I am do, doing I think it's a, a really um what is a great pleasure and then trying to tell people what I'm yeah, doing explain, and uh, explain yeah, your, your role yeah explain my role and get an understanding from the growers and I think um, yeah it is um two-way conversation and fulfilling and, yeah quite fulfilling for you personally to come here and, and see farmers and, and meet absolutely farmers, hands on yeah. farmers and family farms yeah, yeah. um yeah, yeah i think and uh, this is probably first time like i um have like so many farmers yeah, like okay. uh, so first, many farmers uh, in one loo yeah, yeah, farmers here today, so yeah in, a, instead of a, a lot of the time when i um, give a talk a, a lot of agronomists and other scientists and uh, and uh, yeah not that many farmers and uh, i i actually was really happy about today and it was yeah great well, that's good isn't it? Yeah. we put on a good day then and um, yeah it's, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful it's a win-win situation mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot, we've got a lot of information at a meeting yeah, um, about sodic tolerant sites that she's got already so we were we thought we were Robinson Crusoe by ourselves and we never thought um, Edgeroy would have sodic soils and all of a sudden you've got a test site there we didn't really understand yeah. so um, for us it's been you know a two-way street we've, we've learned some information about your test sites mm. that are relative to us that we didn't know so that one bit of information yeah has, has hit home for us give you guys a, a overview of uh, Nanofly wheat breeding program, um, a bit of our objectives and uh, history and uh, um, current, you know, how we do things and uh, a bit of an outcome and future, you know, there's few new things we can do. Uh, so, the, yeah, so you guys know what we are doing, yeah. Uh, you know, first of all, is uh, you know we're facing the apply the the breeding program, and where we target for we target for double north, so it's uh, pretty much northern New South Wales and the Queensland, and uh, we really um, aiming for high yield. We know 
uh, data is where the money comes from, and we're also working on different maturity, and because uh, you know the sowing you are guys all know the planting rain comes, whatever it likes. So we need to have a different maturity variety to actually combat the frost issues. Yeah, and obviously this is a very um, high quality uh, production area. So our bleeding program different from every other bleeding program is we really working on a pH quality. Mm. That's the, the a pH quality requirement there. And, and in this area, we have those major disease is stem rust, leaf rust, strap rust, and crown rot, and nematodes. So we, the variety have to have resistance to these diseases or tolerant to these diseases. Um, on top of that, there's other issues like a black point, you know, pre-harvest sproutings, we all need to take into the consideration. The, the last one, it's not the least, it's the most important, I should I say, is tolerant to uh, sodic soil, acid soil, or drought. Um, so that's the subsoil constraints. Uh, um, last week, Rob showed me around, and you, you got all sorts of soils. So the first problem is the sodicity. And uh, we're not alone. And about 40% of the northern wheat produ production has sodic soil. And so that is actually our breeding program. We pick the right side to testing, screening our lines to try to get a tolerance out of it, yeah. Then when you add acid soil, well then I, have, uh, I can say the wheat belt, the, the wheat belt has more, pro, more problem soil than no problem. Majority of the wheat belt soil has a problem. That's the uh, brown color, color ones, yeah. Um, on top of that, well, this year, last year, we had uh, plenty of rain, but uh, don't forget, uh, Australia actually is a very dry continent. And this is the, this is the uh, map in 2017 to 2019, the drought. So that's what we get. The paddock, sodic soil on the dry condition. You have very low yield. So that's our bleeding program, target for trying to bleeding tolerant variety to all sorts of soil constraints, mainly sodic and dry, drought. Okay, so that is our objectives. And I think I'll try to give you a bit of a history of the narrow flyweight bleeding program. So, um, the no University Senior Northern Weight Improve Improvement Program start 1921. And it wasn't based in Alibli. The research station was somewhere near Canada. Professor Waterhouse start all this work. And at that time, the main problem was stem rust. Stem rust last can cause up to 50 or 70 percent yield loss. So he actually introduced bleeding line from the United States, and he bred two new uh, stem rust resistant varieties. So not a big variety, those two varieties, but shows how the resistant variety can do on the rust pandemic. And then, okay. right off, yeah. What's AGT stand for? AGT stand Australia Grand Technologies. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. 
kept going. Um, and he also worked very closely with the, um, the millers, the cereal camps, and improved quality of the varieties. And he released a top uh, quality variety, Gabo. And that leads to the uh, segregation of the quality, leads to all different class of the Australia wheat and the APH class from that. Um, so with that success, a group of farmers, they actually, um, they borrowed the money and bought an alibi farm, invite the University of Sydney to do the wheat bleeding and the research for them in Nile So in 1961, uh, then uh, Prime Minister, <laughs> Mr. Um, Menzi, he came, opened with uh, West Wheat Research Institute. And that's the, that's Nile start with bleeding. 1961, so it's a 60, 61 years now. And um, that fund, the group of farm fund later transferred to uh, Wheat Research Foundation. That's where Bob's on. And you, so far, until now, still, university is governed by the Wheat Research Foundation. And, uh, uh, from then, I think more than 30 variety was released um, up to AGT takeover. I'll talk a bit more. So, but around the 1990, mid 1990, the public funding is just continual decline. And the wheat bleeding program, I think the doctors probably know all the wheat bleeding program was just surviving. Um, and then also at that time, they amended the uh, what's that, plant bleeding rights registration. So the, that uh, law is not only protect the variety, also protect the production. So we actually can collect the EPRs and pointing loyalty from the varieties. That actually made the um, weight bleeding uh, commercialization possible. So from um, 2001, a University of Sydney and the form a company called Sun Farm C, and that the shareholder is the University of Sydney, Grand Corp GRDC. And at that same time, University of Adelaide formed a company called Australia Grand Technologies, ADT, and the shareholder is a Saudi GRDC, University of Adelaide, and two companies merged to ADT in 2006. And so now the model, the now all Australia, there are no public weight bleeding or private. Yeah, the model is bleeder develop variety, um, the seed company manage the seed and the grow, grow the crop and you set, when you sell the crop, the EPR deducted, the EPR actually come to the breeding company and we use that EPR to breeding varieties to um, improve, you know, have uh, invest modern technologies, invest invest um, equipment and uh, breeding better variety. So that we rely on EPR. I can show you how much improvement we have done um, after commercialization. Um, so from, that was uh, when I joined and everything's enveloped, <laughs> manual handling, and then we, when we, 2005, we start, well, we're still struggling. The company is still struggling. We don't have much of a cash. And, but we start to actually change a better system. It's still manual loading, but a lot quicker. And now, 
we have robot loading Chelsea. The robot actually, that robot every time you can, if the experiment is about 300 plots, you can load eight plots at, at once. Let's see whether I can make this run. I can't get it wrong. That's fine. So the robot loading the seed, it's a lot more efficient, accurate, uh, yeah, works much better. Okay. And also we now have GPS. So you know the, the girls only load, can load 24 plots at once, and it trips very accurately and in one go in 24 plots. Yeah. I probably can't get that running either, so, but that's okay. And from um, for our early generation and before a lot of those, we use a rice binder to harvest. And for our plot, and we use a very primitive harvest before. And uh, but now we have this. Um, air conditioning cabin harvest now. And it's because of, because of whoever harvesting and uh, in the air condition, he, he's, he lasts a lot longer. He, he can harvest more, definitely. And uh, the main thing for me is it's onboard weighing. So when they finish harvest, they got all the data. And at the end of the day, they send the file to me. I can analyze the yield straight away instead of we have to weigh in the shed after harvest. You don't get data in two months time. Yeah, it's, so it's much better. Um, we no longer use a big thick field book, like a paper pen, and we, everything is in our mobile phone. We can just use, carry our phone and go to the field, and, and everything is Barcode. We have used unique barcode to record all the data and, and go back to our data system. So from harvest, seed preparation, quality test, or have a proper barcode. Yep. The other thing is uh, probably you'll hear about this uh, gene genomic um, selection. So with the for my breeding program, we start probably in F2, about one million individuals. And I did a calculation um, from, um, from University of Sydney all the way till now. Each year, in average, we probably only release 1.4 variety. Some year we don't have any, some year we probably release two or more. Yeah, so 1.4 out of a million. It really looks like, look at the needle in the haystack in the early, the early stage. So we, with genomic selection, we still look needle in the haystack, but a lot more accurate and quicker. Um, but this is the cost quite costly, and with the cost reduced now, and our number is straight away up. Now we do 10, like my program, about 10 million data point with genomic selection. The good thing is, even in the early generation, we only have a few grams of seed, we can do all the estimation, include disease resistance, yield, maturity, and quality. But for the quality, you know, usually you, have, you only can do advanced generation because you don't have enough samples, you don't have the time to do it. But with genomic selection, we can do early generations, only have very small quantity of seed. So we're a lot more accurate breeding now. Um, just want to go through with you uh, our breeding sort of process from year one to when we, we finish. And uh, there's a, a lot more details, but uh, we are sort of just give you a bit of a picture. Yeah, so each year I probably make about 150 to 200 crosses. 
And those crosses had some uh, single cross, some uh, back cross. And for the back cross, or we do a bit of a mark assistant selection to enrich the populations. And then we have a summer increase. And then the for F2, sorry, there's no summer increase here. So F2, there's 1 million individuals. We will do some simple trait selection in the field, like plant type maturity, and plant heights, and the rust resistance, if, if, if there's rust. Then there's summer increase. And then F4, we have probably about half million individuals. We will select plant type maturity rust again in the field. And then we probably have about 20,000 of individuals with sigola. <laughs> and in summer, we do genomic selection for those ones. And the lab can turn around the data very quickly, like eight weeks, we will get the results. And so for this generation, because we do in summer, we actually reduce one year. And we call the number down to about 10,000, half of them. And we start our first year yield testing. And we actually split two maturities. So one for early planting, one for May. And that's, that's a lot going on, but it's the first year yield test, that's all. And then we'll be able to reduce number about 60%. And then we have a second year yield test. At this time, it goes to eight locations. And I will show you later where the eight location goes. And also have a lot more disease testing. And the survival lines will go on plot quality test. And because we have a lot of data, a lot of yield testing, and we comfort, comfortable go cow the number down very hard, we probably only keep about 10% lines and go to next level. And then there's lots of testing, a lot of yield testing, a lot of disease testing, and, and we, we do, yeah. And then is probably only about 20 lines left. Yeah, and then this will go to the whole company and across whole Australia. Inside of a company, we test all, all of them in 49 locations. And by that time, we sort of collecting a lot more data and we're thinking about the MVT entries and the, and the second year and the end of the second year of the stage four testing. And we will nominate about three, four lines to MVT, and we also start to submit data to uh, weight classification panel to try to get a pH classification. And then in year 10 or year 11, we will release. So, right. So take 10 years to release a variety, if we're lucky. So that's <laughs> snapshots of the um, reading. So this is, I just want to um, tell you a bit of our, our program style. So you see the, the orange dropping is our yield side, and the blue dropping is our disease nursery side. So for yield, we target mainly target for northern region for our stage one and the two. And we probably each year, we have 55,000 plots. And disease nursery in across Australia, three location, mainly rust, also we have crown lot nematodes and the yellow liver spots. And that's, um, yeah, about 50,000 tests too. Uh, obviously we do the quality test, mainly genomic. Selection for early stage, by the late stage, we have about 400 um, uh, lines each year we're testing in the lab. So that's the, a lot of the numbers we deal with. Um, so this is, uh, um, I'm trying to tell you the location. For the, our stage one, we only goes to three locations, but now actually this year we start goes to Queensland too. 
So there's four locations, and there's a two location uh, sodic soil. So we are actually working on sodic soil, yeah. And then for stage two, and we expand it. So we go more to north and west and try to testing and the south, marginal area and the different soil. And the stage three, we actually goes to, to the south, uh, uh, New South Wales too, yeah. Obviously that's uh, stage four, so no, across four countries. So more location, less line, more location, and we use uh, we use the location to try to uh, predict different years. So reduce, increase the location, reduce the year of the testing, trying to release variety quicker. So with the um, uh, persistently, I'm trying to uh, come back the uh, bleeding variety to come back the soil, uh, subsoil constraints. We have a little bit of outcomes here is the uh, some top that has a sodic soil tolerance. And if you, and this is the um, data by, uh, from um, AMPS. And if you get the red color is barley and the blue is wheat. And the sun top is the first one after the red. You can see clearly it has higher yield compared with other bread weight on the sodic condition. It's close to some of the barley's. And this is actually consistent in four or five years data. So we know this, is, this one has a sodic tolerance. And we now have new varieties of this we tell you actually are uh, <coughs> similar sodic soil tolerance, but better yield. Yeah. And another one is a Sun Max. And this one it has acid soil tolerance. I know, and uh, we mainly is the sodic here, but then we do have acid soil everywhere too. And this one is uh, for early, like a very slow, long spring variety for mid mid April planting has very APH and has very good acid soil tolerance and also very good strap plus resistance. So that's sort of a little bit of outcome and it take take a long time to come. And we build up our germplasms gradually. And so for the future, what we do is we we have this new technology and called a rapid generation advance, and we have the uh, we invested uh, growth room. We can um, have three generation in one year, and you see this. Uh, the seal is very very small. You see each each stem is one line, so in that seven. Uh, little blocks probably have 700 lines there. Yeah, so we're trying to be quicker. Not only just be quicker, we also uh, use the uh, molecular marker and a genomic selection to select. So we push them quicker and better. And by doing that, we probably can reduce one year from this 10 year, 10 year bleeding cycle again. So that's one. The other one is machine learning, artificial intelligence, everyone talked about it. And we are involved with this, and we think, I don't know how familiar you guys with Crown Lot, that is a very hard disease to, to, to assess, to screening, to bleeding for. And we're trying to use machine learning to develop a simple, quick screening method and to trying to bleed in this variety better, this disease tolerance better. Okay, so that's, that's the team, and then all the, uh, whatever we achieve, achieve is from the whole team. We work together. Thank you. The sodic soil tolerance, does that allow the roots to go deeper into the sodic layer, or how does that tolerance work, Mike Quinn? Um, 
I actually not quite sure. And uh, someone <laughs> someone's working on it. And I think do you know better, Douglas? Uh, no, not yeah. really. So what actually I understand is it's definitely something to do with the roots. Yeah. And uh, wheat is uh, very good at extrude the the so, uh, the sodium. Uh, so it not not this one. It it has to be um, a, the uh, the capability to absorb more moisture out of a sodic soil. I think that's that's what I I tend to think. Yeah. Unfortunately, not all sodic soils are the same. So there's different. Um, elements that the, the varieties are using to sort of get over it. Some are um, sodium based, some are chloride based, yeah. um, and there's compaction in there as well. So there's a number of different attributes that make up sodicity, which means that different varieties and different species handle them differently. And I've got some slides on that when I talk about that a bit later. My question's about drought tolerance. Um, is it likely to make a large difference, like could you sacrifice some yield and have drought tolerance and make a big difference, that's all? Um, so um, so what the L approach, well obviously um, there's some researchers uh, using uh, GMO uh, or gene editing trying to put uh, drought tolerance gene into into the um, adapter background and we we can't do this yet. Uh, all we do is uh, screening our lines from early and mid-generation on the drought condition. So whatever is a, a tolerant, you know, yield better on the drought condition, on a normal condition, and we, we will have them. And the problem with, um, is, uh, if, if they, um, if they uh, perform really well on the drought condition, but if they don't perform well on the normal condition, I don't think anyone wants it. Commercially <laughs> Yeah, um, that's, the, that's the problem. But, and we do have varieties say, um, they perform better on the marginal condition. So we, um, Douglas will tell people like, uh, Okay, this is probably really not absolutely high yield potential, but it, it, it does work well on the marginal condition. So I would say it depends on all your individual farm. You think you have problem, more problem with drought, and you probably should have picked the variety has a bit of a drought tolerance, but not like absolutely high yield. I, I, I guess. To us, we just release variety, offer all the options. So then uh, the agronomist or the farmers, and you just need to pick the right variety for you. Um, we grew Sunblade last year. Um, how does it compare on that sodicity chart compared to Suntop for the area? Um, the, in terms of um, sunblade, uh, disease-wise is uh, quite similar to sun top, uh, but uh, I'm not quite sure whether it has sodic soil tolerance. Yeah, because we, we haven't been tested. Yeah. Um, um, other thing is uh, it, it has better yield than sun top. And the leaf rust, probably not as good as sun top, uh, but I think probably is not, uh, not, a, not that bad. So if you trying to compare. Uh, nematode tolerance, very similar. Uh, crown lot, the tolerance, I think it's slightly worse. Yeah, not quite as good. Not quite, not quite as good, yeah. But it yield better. Mm. Uh, the 
it's a, it's not necessarily government hold up. It's our consumers. Yeah. So because you know, and uh, 70, 80 percent of Australia wheat is export. So if uh, if our consumer don't like GMO, we can't do it. But having said that, there's a gene editing we can do now. Uh, and what the new policy is, oh, I should have put on the future. <laughs> the new policy is so long you don't aid anything, you can change the gene structure, you can delete the DNA, and um, this is not GMO. So we are free to use gene editing technology and to improve the disease resistance well, hopefully, some drought or sodic tolerance. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, yes. We have nominated a uh, few lines to work on this. But the first step, because we're trying to test in the water, the first step actually was the um, weak color. We are doing it because there's some. Um, uh, nematode resistant gene is linked with yellow flower. And when, when if flower is too yellow, and we, uh, nobody likes it because we, we no longer be able to use bleach to bleach the flower. So, and we can't get a classification. So the first one we're actually going to do is knock this uh, yellow flower out of it and keep the uh, nematode resistance. That's the one and we are going to do. Um, yeah, Meekwin, um, just uh, what are some of the sites um, around Narrabri locally where you've got the actual trials happening? Or are they just at the main research station in Narrabri? Yeah, so in the um, PBI, and we have actually reduced, um, reduced our plot size a lot because we bought uh, Sunville Farm. Uh, if you guys see my, this one, this is our Sunville Farm, yeah. And so we, uh, our, our majority of our plot work is our, on Sunville Farm now. In PBI, we have a lot of uh, populations and disease nursery. Yeah. Thank you. But outside of that, we've got the site at Edroy. Yeah. That's a sodic and soil. Yeah. North Star. Mm. Um, and then Walgett would be yeah, fairly extreme. That's right, yeah. And I didn't say that all these individuals here, yeah. Uh, simple question. Once you get a suitable variety, how long does it take before you can get it to the general farmer? It's like every year. Do you want me to deal with that? Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> it's a simple question, I know, but it just intrigues me. Um, my role with, within AGT is to deal with marketing and seed production work. So Machin does all the hard work in providing the new varieties. Um, so she went through that progression of how long it takes to develop a variety. Once she gets a stable line that we've then tested in the NVT, um, then we decide we need to release it. That's where I take control. So Machin will build up seed on Sunville Farm to about one tonne of seed. And then that next season, I will then go to contractors um, so some farmers around the district and I'll say, look, I've got a new line that we're thinking of releasing. Um, and I'll say, look, I need to generate 25 to 40 tonne of this new line. And that'll be under contract. Uh, they will produce that seed to high standard of seed quality. And then from there, I take that to the seed companies and say, look, I've got 40 tonnes of this brand new variety. It's going to take over the world. And they say, you beauty, I'll take all of it. Um, and then they generate sort of 1,000 to 2,000 tonne of seed for sale to the farmer the next year. So once we've stabilised a new variety and we think it's going to be released, it's really two years before it gets to the farmer. So not very long at all. Um, and now that we're delving into canola and other crops, uh, canola, you don't need as much seed. So that process is even quicker of generating enough seed to go to the farmers. So um, when we released Sunblade last season to the farmers, uh, we got about um, 1,800 tonne of Sunblade seed out to the farmers in that first season. So that was quite rapid in that uptake. So 
It doesn't take very long once we decide to release it to build up. Uh, so two years and then we're done. So fairly, fairly simple. Just wondering, at those trial sites you've got there, what percent sodium's in the soil roughly? Like is it, because we deal with some blokes out here that are north of 15% sodium. Do you have any trial sites that are in that extreme or are they between five and 10% or? Not quite sure. Ours Probably are... something that sort of falls more to amps to identify sites that are mm. more sodic and they will sort of run specific trials on their sites. Yeah. So the one I, the, the one I have data I presented the graph, that is quite high sodic um, soil. So our trial site is not as extreme as that, but uh, our edgeloy site is definitely like what everyone said, is, a, is a too wet Sunday, too dry Monday sort of thing. Yeah, it, it's very hard to deal with it. So it's more like, um, I think Douglas mentioned a little bit, it's more like structure too. It's not necessarily um, like a very high soil. It's just a bad structure. And very hard to deal with it and, uh, and very um, uh, unforgiving in the conditions, yeah. Um, my question is, we run mainly a grazing concern. Um, what about the development of dual purposes, purpose wheats? Now, I know economically it's not as viable because you're not getting the great yields because you're feeding stock. But, I mean, some of us are in a position where you may graze something off and then want to strip it, which really does give you a fairly good economic base in that situation. So how are you going that way? Um, so, um, personally... <laughs> And I, I love it. <laughs> That's the long relationship between Bob and the Narrow Bright program. We are uh, really list, uh, really list uh, um, Napalu, Molombi first, and then Napalu. Um, but now, and my, uh, we have a um, winter wheat program based in Wagga Wagga. All right. Yeah, so we do have a winter wheat breeder, and she's working on it. Yeah, yeah, that's the. Um, we we still try to cover it. So, um, yes, AGT is a commercial company, but uh, and I, our we we're not only just for making money. I know we. <laughs> <laughs> but we're all driven. I mean, a little bit by that. We've yeah, got about. We, it's got to be viable. We need it. We need the income. We need the income. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, um, our um, our um, aim is work for the farmers. Uh, so we we do take all this into the consideration. If there's need, we will do it. Yeah. So the the lady in Wagga is working on it, and I sort of like uh, probably do a tiny bit each year, <laughs> see whether anything comes out of it. Yeah. Probably 30 years ago, we had an experimental dual purpose winter wheat that the Department of Ag wouldn't allow to be released. And May Quinn and Frank Ellison said, well, give it to us, we'll fix it up for you. And, and that was, they did, and that was Morombi and later on Naparoo. And um, we're just so grateful because they were such important dual purpose wheats and probably the the early generation of what we're getting th coming through other breeding programs as well now. I think, yeah, in addition to that, we've got sun lamb, which is, oh, yeah, good. more a forage wheat rather yeah. than a dual purpose wheat, but it does suit that role. Mm -hmm. um, and sun lamb's had quite a bit of success in this part of the world because it's not a true winter, it's a, a long spring wheat which means it doesn't have as much of a vernalisation hold on it, um, which means where we're sort of in a bit warmer climate than further south in New South Wales, uh, we can have more success with a variety like sun lamb than a true winter type. Oh, Rob, thanks very much for the invitation to come and have a chat to you today. Um, 
I really do enjoy getting to these type of events, talking to the people on the ground that are growing our varieties and, and dealing with the community. So we um, try and spread our tentacles as far as we can. And my aim is for you to go away from today with something. So if it's not information and knowledge, that's fine. Um, hopefully we can find plenty of that in what we're talking about. But if you don't find anything of use in what I'm talking about, then feel free to take a stubby cooler or a pen to at least go away from today with something. So that's, that's a, a really key point, that, that you do go away better off than when you came when you, when, at the start of the day. So, you know, obviously Machen's talked a little bit about where we've come from as a company, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm from a family farming background early on in my days. Um, so my father started in South Australia, then we were at North Star for a while, and then I ended up farming with, with my parents at Hannaford, so in Queensland. So there for a, sort of three and a half years before I joined the DPI, and I was doing wheat breeding research with the DPI. So I first um, came across Mei Chin when she was working for the University of Sydney. I was working with the DPI in Toowoomba. Um, and doing a lot of wheat breeding trials and, and research work. And then I ended up doing NVT for Queensland, so national variety trials, evaluating all of the material. So I've had a, a good background in evaluation of material um, and also sort of morphed into a little bit of um, research agronomy work with the DPI, or DAF as it was called when I finished up. Uh, and then about four and a half years ago, I joined AGT, so take on the role of marketing and production and what we now call variety support. So really, I look at taking the information that Mei Chin and the team have gathered and making it accessible to farmers and agronomists so they know as much about the varieties as they can to make the best decisions possible for their farms and their farming enterprise. And we really value your input, so certainly getting questions from you is very important. That helps direct what we do as a company um, and Mei Chin as a breeder into what she values in terms of the input to the variety. So talking about sadicity is very important, but obviously the easy things to kill are yield. So if we can maximize the yield, that's a great start. And then if we can take care of some of those um, prevalent diseases that really limit what we can do with our, our cropping, um, then that's sort of the low-hanging fruit. It takes a lot of work, but it's very easy to put resources into those because they are so prevalent. But when we look at things outside of that, like drought tolerance, sodicity, um, frost hardiness, all sorts of things like that, that sort of add on. But one thing that Mei Chin didn't mention is the more attributes that we try and put into a single variety, the harder it is to get something useful out of the back end. <coughs> so we have heard in the last few years about some feed wheat programs where they're not interested in the quality classification side. Um, that makes it a little bit easier to make advan advances in yield production because they're not worried about the quality of the grain at the end. If we introduce some quality parameters to our wheat varieties, then we slow down the progress we can make in our yield advantage. But at the moment, the highest yielding varieties are our APH varieties, so that grain quality is still there in a really high yield background. So we're making lots of progress. But um, what I thought I'd start off with today is stealing a friend of mine, Jack Christopher. Um, so he's a researcher with DAF in Toowoomba working in soil science. He's done a bit of work on sodicity, so I thought we'd review a little bit of sodicity work, if that's of interest to you. So Jack prepared this for a, a talk he did at Meandara, talking about sodic soils. So in Queensland, New South Wales, constraints um, regarding sodicity with uh, toxic chloride concentrations, probably the main limiting factors. Um, and also some acid subsoils. So that's sort of the, the drivers of sodicity in our part of the world. Um, and they really reduce the ability of the plant to extract water from the soil. And that makes it look like there's drought um, conditions. So 
there's a couple of different things. Sodicity can make it look like you're suffering drought stress. Um, obviously, if it doesn't rain, it looks like there's drought stress. And another one that adds to that is um, root lesion nematodes. So when they start affecting the root's ability to, to take up the water, then we get drought stress symptoms there as well. So there's a number of things that can combine to make it look very much like you're suffering drought. Um, so if you get a bit of rainfall event, it might sort of brush over those, but in a good season where we're getting plentiful rainfall, it can mask some of those problems. Um, and obviously, we get different crops that deal with sodicity in different ways, and also between, um, within species, between varieties, we get some differences. So there's a fair bit there. Um, I've only taken a portion of what Jack was talking about at the GRDC update. Um, but these are some of the key attributes. Uh, looking at the northern region, sodicity in the surface and the subsoil. So we're looking at pH, um, cation exchange, chloride, and salt as well. So we're looking at some different... So chloride toxicity. So we can see those sodic soils are quite high compared to a non-sodic soil. So there's quite a range of um, sort of parameters that we look at when we're looking at sodicity. And in the south, we get some different ones. So um, more sodium toxicity rather than chloride toxicity um, and differences in soil structure and aluminium and boron tolerance. So we can see Machen's already covered this a little bit. There is a quite an area that's covered and the annual loss from sodic soils is quite high. So we can see there those chloride soils are sort of in that Queensland, northern New South Wales, and then once we get down to southern, southern New South Wales, it changes a little bit in that chloride toxicity. Um, obviously, Queensland, New South Wales, surface crusting, high chloride at depth, um, and impedes the ability of the roots to take in uh, calcium and potassium, and also low pH. So we do have some of those instances where we've got a high sodic soil, um, or non-sodic and a high sodic soil. So we get some differences in yield potential. And, um, you know, we can see some impacts of that as we go. We... But this is where we, we get to something that might be of use to you. We can see salinity. We have the green bars where we're not seeing any effect. Um, so no salinity constraint likely. So we can see some differences between the bread wheat and durum wheat are quite similar. Barley, a bit more of a buffer there to the salinity. Um, triticale, sort of the, the bad effects sort of kick in a bit further up that scale. And then we've got some oil seeds, canola and safflower with a slightly different profile. So we do see a range of um, species in there and how they cope with salinity is a little bit different. Um, same with acidity. So there's, you know, not a lot of difference between those, but playing on the margins, um, if you've got a variety or a soil that is on the margin there, you might make a shift from one species to another and make a, a bit of an advantage. But here's where we, we get things a little bit interesting. Um, so obviously, you know, Jack and a lot of researchers have pulled a bit of information together to come up with a bit of a sodicity tolerance ranking. And we can see sodic soils, barley seems to cope with it better than most others, but we've got a lot of cereals up here. Barley, triticale, bread wheat, durum wheat, down into our millet, sunflower, sorghum. Then down the bottom we've got things like safflower, chickpea, mung beans and lentils and lupins. So there's quite a, a reasonable grading of um, variety or species and their ability to cope with sodic soils. And another thing that comes with some of those sodic soils is compaction. So we can see bread wheat copes reasonably well with soticity in terms of the crops we might grow and its ability for those roots to forage in amongst compact soils is reasonably good. Um, triticale sort of not quite as good with a compaction in the soil, 
Um, whereas lupin and safflower, while they don't cope with the sodic soils particularly well, are very good at breaking up that compaction. Um, so safflower is a crop that's had a little bit of interest up here for coping with compaction, and we have tried that at Sunville uh, to try and get better water penetration through compacted layers in our soil there. Um, lupin's one that's a little bit interesting, something that's more suited to southern New South Wales. Um, but since we do have a lupin breeding program, um, I thought it might be interesting to throw that one in there. And I do know of a grower at um, Weewar that's trialling a bit of lupins this season to break open some of that compaction. So we'll see how that goes. And if he has some success with it, then we might look at um, testing a few of our lupin varieties up here in this part of the world and see what we can do with them. And see, wheat's adaption to sodic soils can be a little bit uh, different depending varieties. So Machin's also talked a little bit about that, how different varieties cope with and tolerate sodic soils. So Jack and some of the other researchers are working on a bit of a ranking system um, based on all of those different constraints. Um, they've got a number of sites and obviously in you know, the environment does play a, a part in um, what sort of evidence you're seeing of sodicity. So where we've had reasonably in crop rainfall in 2015-16, weren't able to get a genetic difference uh, in the trials um, through sodic soils, whereas where we were getting a combination of drought stress, um, lower yields overall, but are getting a bit of a, gen a genotype differentiation in there. So the more trials they can do, the more data they can collect, the better those uh, rankings will be. So this one's a little bit different. It doesn't have, it's a bit more of a, a scattered variety profile. There's a couple of common ones, Gregory and Lancer. Um, they didn't have Suntop in that um, program when they were testing it. So we haven't seen where that one fit up, but Mitch, um, is a quite a high yielding variety in less sodic soils. Um, but we can see that's a bit of a gradation from the, the lower yielding to the higher yielding. But when you add that highly sodic soil, it does get a bit more sporadic. So some varieties cope with it a little bit better than others. So that's a, a really sort of a basic introduction to sodic soils. Um, so if you've got any questions about that, I'm not an expert in sodic soils but I can certainly access some information for you if you want some more information on that. But my role within the in AGT is really taking our variety information and getting it to farmers. So that's what I'll spend the, the rest of um, you know, this morning's talk, talk um, exploring, and we have a lot to cover. So these are our cereal varieties. We sort of break them up into our early season um, because in the NVT they have an early season trial series and a main season. So early season, sort of from Anzac Day planting through to mid-May, uh, and then main season is sort of mid-May through to the end of the season. So within the early season, we're dealing mostly with Sunmax, and I've got that on a line by itself because it is a, a unique variety in terms of its maturity. And then in that slow spring category, Sort of, um, we're dealing with Sunflex, Kula, Kuta, and Catapult to a certain extent. And they all have dif different attributes. So that's what we can tease apart a little bit. In the main season, we're looking at Sunblade and Sunmaster. So they're two newer varieties, both bred from Suntop. Um, and then we're looking in sort of that quick wheat category, Calibre, which I'll explain to you a little bit later. It's probably one you haven't heard of. Sun Chaser and Sun Central. And then obviously Durham wheat, so you know, a very specific market um, for all the pasta producers out there. Uh, we have a variety that's doing very well, Westcourt. And barley, we've got two varieties for the northern region, Beast and Yeti. And I've just thrown this one in here, Coaxium Aggressor Barley, AGTB. 325, and that's one that we're looking to release later this season. So that's a very specific barley that we'll talk about. If we look at things outside the cereals, um, 
Oops, I've still got barley up there. We've covered that. Canola. We've got three canola lines that we will be releasing later this year. Uh, so this is our first canola varieties that will hit the market. Um, two triazine tolerant varieties and one con conventional canola variety. And they're all what we call open pollinated. So they're not hybrids. Uh, open pollinated varieties means that you can keep the seed yourself and regrow it the next season, which then brings into that uh, seed sharing as an option. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a lupin program. We've released Coyote. That's doing very well in Western Australia um, and sort of getting into the South Australia and Southern New South Wales market at the moment. And one that we are releasing shortly, AGTP006. And a couple of triticales which might be of interest. We don't deal with a, a lot of triticale up here. Um, but we have a couple of varieties on the books, astute and, and bison at the moment. So what we can do is have a look at those varieties as where they fit in with their maturity, what their area of adaptation might be, if there's some specific things there that are of interest, uh, disease profiles and yield performance. So I like to take a lot of data from the NVT program mainly because it's easily accessible. So if you're interested in it yourself, you can go onto NVT online and check out the information that you're interested in and you can double check what I'm telling you. So you might say, oh, that seems a little bit unrealistic that Sunmaster is so much ahead of everything else. Go in there, check it out and find out that, oh yeah, he was telling the truth, it is doing well. So that's great. So it's always good to double check this information. Um, so if we go first into maturity, what varieties are you familiar with at the moment? None? <laughs> yep, radio. Lancer, where does that fit in? What's the, the ideal sowing window for Lancer? Late April. Late April, oh, on the ball. Radio. So that's a, sort of what we call that early season. Um, so there's a number of varieties in that category. Um, so if we start down the bottom, Sun Max, you would plant mid-April uh, through to the end of April would be its ideal fit. Um, and then after that, we've got a bit of a gap between Sun Max and then we're getting into these Lancer types. So they're what we call slow spring or mid-slow springs. Um, so we've got a number of varieties in there now. Kula is doing particularly well, and that's derived from Gregory. So Gregory's been around for a while. That was bred by the Queensland Department of Primary Industries under the EGA banner. Uh, Sunflex, Machin has developed that variety for this region. Um, so that's a, a slower maturing variety in that slow spring category. And then in that mid-slow spring from Lancer through to Mitch, there's quite a number of varieties. So there's, that's been where the real interest has been in the last few years, trying to get the varieties in as early as possible um, because after that, you never know when it's going to rain again. But this season, it's just kept raining. And therefore, we've got a lot of opportunity to grow these varieties in the quick to mid-spring category. So we're looking from Sunmaster um, all the way through to varieties like Sun Prime, which is probably the quickest variety we've got. Um, Mustangs up there pretty close. Um, so there's quite a range of maturities with our wheat varieties. Um, and I haven't included in there any dual purpose wheats, so they'd probably fit in here with that winter wheat type. So which means you, you've probably got the possibility of planting it in March. Um, Probably a little bit less certain with that because it's so hot in March up here. Um, obviously, the more temperature you have, the more impact it has in terms of, you know, trying to establish a seedling in hot conditions is a much harder prospect than trying to establish a wheat seedling in cooler conditions. So maturity, there's quite a range there. Barley varieties, not so much in terms of maturity. Um, and the durum wheats tend to fit in sort of from that mid-spring up to the quick spring. So the barley and the durum are a lot more restricted in their sort of breadth of planting window. 
So Sun Max, obviously, that's a variety that is really suited to that mid-April sowing. Um, does have that acid soil tolerance to a certain degree, so it is a, a good option there. Um, it's been a bit of a, I suppose, unique variety. Because it can be planted so much earlier, the option is for the farmer to get their system rolling, take advantage of any early sowing opportunities, um, and just to give them a bit of a break and spread out their sowing over a longer period of time. And it has done very well. It is a variety that produces a lot of biomass. It tillers very well. Um, so it is one that could be used in a grazing um, sort of way. So I know sort of some growers down around Griffith do use it in that respect because it does produce a lot of biomass. Um, so you can use that for other purposes. But what we have seen in the last couple of seasons is that really with some good rainfall early in the season, it produces a lot of biomass and a lot of yield potential. Um, so it can sort of overcommit early on, get some dry weather in August, and then it sort of looks a little bit ratty and doesn't quite live up to, to its potential. But all things considered, it's doing particularly well. And in New South Wales, the last couple of seasons, a crop of Sun Max has won the state wheat competition. Um, sort of more on the Liverpool Plains where they've got some deeper soils. I know uh, at Willow Tree they grew a crop. Um, limited sort of in-crop rainfall went 7.1 tonne to the hectare dry land and they dug a soil pick and they actually found roots down to 2.1 metres. So with that longer growing season, the potential for those roots to explore a greater depth of soil is there. So obviously root growth is related to the length of seed growing season and Sun Max being such a long season variety, uh, it does have that potential to access moisture further down than some of our quicker maturing varieties. Sunflex, um, this is a variety that is quite high yielding, so it does suit sort of the eastern side of the Newell Highway a little bit more than the western side um, because it has that high yield potential. Uh, quite a, sh a short plant type, a very large seed size and um, you know, it does have an ability to be planted a bit earlier than some of your varieties like Lancer um, because the maturity is just a fraction longer. So we sort of work from about the 20th of April onwards um, so it gives you a little bit of a, you know, maybe a week's break on something like Lancer or Kular or Gregory. So with that large grain size, it does have low screenings um, and also it has a longer coleoptile than many of the other varieties in that early sowing window, which means if you're doing some moisture seeking, growing a variety like Sunflex gives you that potential to get a bit better establishment than with a variety that has a, a shorter coleoptile. So certainly a, a good option, um, but you sort of really want to be working in that late April, early May. Once you get past mid-May, it sort of loses its potential. Kula has been around for a little while and um, probably up until last year was the benchmark in the early season varieties. So that's derived from Gregory. It's got um, reasonable rust tolerance um, so stripe rust is still quite good, um, but what we've seen last season was that there was a high uh, stripe rust pressure on varieties, and because it had a good rating, some growers sort of didn't prioritise spraying it with a fungicide early enough, so we did see a little bit more stripe rust in it than we expected, but um, it certainly is a very good option, and it's a very high yielding variety. So very similar in plant type to Gregory and Flanker, um, but it does have much better tolerance to lodging, so it will stand up a bit better than those varieties. New one on the block, Cooter. We will see a little bit of this one about this year. It's a, a really good variety. It's come out of our Wagga breeding program. Um, two sort of experimental lines are, are the parents for this one. It's a shorter plant type, much more similar to Lancer than a lot of the others. Um, but it does have a much higher yield potential than Lancer. So looking at around about a 10% advantage for Kuta over Lancer. 
Um, so we're getting a much better value out of our, our crop with this one. APH classification. Um, in comparison to Lancer, uh, it covers off on most of the diseases very well. Lancer has a very good stripe rust package. Kuta probably not quite as good, but if you give it a good fungicide preventative spray early on, should protect it very well. So there's a lot to like about this one. I think um, this season we'll see some good crops around the district and I think it should, should really um, start to hit the ground nicely in the next season or two and hopefully start to take over in a lot of areas uh, from Lancer. So I've just thrown this one in here as a little bit of a, an add-on. So catapult, so that's derived from a variety called mace. Um, so that's a South Australian line and it's done particularly well down there, but we have seen it do very well yield-wise in the NVT in this part of the world. So there's a number of growers that have sort of got onto it for its high yield potential. It's an AH variety. Um, stripe rust is not quite as good as what we'd expect for this part of the world, but still, if you protect it with a preventative fungicide, it has a lot of options there for you. So catapult, high yield, um, quite similar in maturity to Kuta, but probably a slightly wider sowing window. So if you have a look at some of the yield results, um, so this is from the early season wheat trials from northwest New South Wales. So spanning sort of 2017 to 2020. So we can see down here I've got um, sort of the different years identified. So what I like to do is where varieties have been included for all five years, you can get a really good estimate of their yield potential because you can compare comparing like for like. So we've got five years of data for Gregory, Flanker, Lancer, and Kular. And Kular's, you know, if we look at the, the region average, so this is the northern region, the green line. Um, so that's, or for that northwest over the five years. So Kular is a step above sort of your Lancer, Flanker, and Gregory. So they're all quite similar in potential, whereas Kular's that step up. But if we look at some varieties that only been in for three years, Kuta and Catapult, uh, right up the very top, and Rockstar sort of up there with Catapult. And there's a bit of similarity between C Catapult and Rockstar, both derived from Mace, so they've got a common parent there. Um, Rockstar, although it has yielded well, uh, these trials have all been well protected from stripe rust. So that shouldn't be an influence there, but Rockstar is one that really struggles in that um, stripe rust resistance rating. So early season varieties, we've got a lot of material there and some really good yield advantages coming through. The other aspect is the disease resistance and tolerance. Um, if, you, if you pull this material or information out of the NVT online, um, you can sort of build a bit of a spreadsheet, but what I like to do is identify areas of weakness. Uh, so if a variety has a weakness, you might say, oh look, I'm not prepared to deal with that, or I can't deal with that, so I won't use that variety. Or I say, all right, there's a, a lot of attributes here for that variety that I do like, but there's a weakness with rust, which means I need to be very timely with my fungicide applications. So Catapult and Rockstar, both high yielding varieties, but they've both got a bit of a weakness with the stripe rust. Um, so these are the three G, um, pathotypes of the stripe rust with an overall rating. Um, so if you're interested in growing a variety like that, make sure you apply your fungicides at the right time. But then if we're looking at something like crown rot, varieties that are susceptible, you can't treat crown rot in the paddock. Um, I know companies are working on some fungicides that will help with that. But um, if you have the potential in your paddock, you know, with a high inoculum level of crown rot, you might want to keep away from varieties that are susceptible. Um, so crown rot susceptibility is a, well, it's a resistance rating. So that's looking at the ability of that variety to actually um, keep that infection out of its system. Um, we don't have a lot to work with, unfortunately. Mitch is probably the best of them with an MS rating. 
Um, and then S ratings for Gregory and the others. So there, there's not a big spread in the ability of those wheat plants to cope with, with crown rot. So there's a, a few things there that you might take out of that. And um, all that information is easily accessible. So at AGT at Sunville, we are doing our own crown rot research. So rather than looking at the susceptibility of the variety, we're looking at its ability to cope with a high crown rot uh, infection in the paddock. So we've actually inoculated all of these plots and put the same amount of crown rot infection over the top of them. So all of these varieties have you know, the same access to the crown rot infection, but we're just sort of separating them on the ability to maintain their yield, even though there is a high crown rot level there. So as I said, Mitch has got you know, probably the best rating of an MS in terms of resistance susceptibility. And its crown rot yield is probably the best of any of those. So Lancer has been the go-to variety, and that's been one of the reasons that Lancer has done well, is that it does have a reasonable rating for crown rot, and it also maintains its yield quite well in crown rot situations. But now we have Kuta, which is doing probably just a fraction better than Lancer in crown rot infected paddocks. And overall, where we don't have crown rot, it's doing even better. So, you know, we've got something to work with there. And Kular's not far behind, but then once you get to, you know, variety Stealth, Rockstar, Sunflex, Sunmax, our yield is dropping away when you introduce a high level of crown rot. And the other aspect is obviously grain quality. So looking at protein, test weight, screenings. So Kular, not too bad. Kuta, and um, I don't have Sunflex in there because unfortunately Sunflex wasn't in the NVT last year. But Kuta has very low screenings. So that's what we're looking at, a really consistent seed size. So if you get some tough conditions, we won't get uh, sort of knocked out of that APH classification by having high screenings levels. So a bit of an early wheat summary. Um, we have that early to mid-April Sunmax, late April Sunflex, um, which what I've done is, is you know, an established competitor. So there's really nothing in that Sunmax category. So therefore it's 100% above everything else. Um, early sown Lancer. So if you wanted to push Lancer right out the front of its window, Sunflex is probably about 9.1% higher. Cooler about 10% higher than Lancer in that late April, early May. And early May, Cuda, almost 11% higher yielding than Lancer in the northern region. So, yeah, we've got a lot of uh, varieties out there that we can make some progress with in that early season um, maturity window. If we look quickly at some of the main season varieties, we've got Sunblade. We um, talked a little bit about that before. It is a clear field variety, so you know, obviously there's a couple of ways you can use Sunblade. Either spray in crop with Intervix to control some of your grass weeds, um, or group B herbicide, so it does have that option. Or you can use, say if you're growing mung beans over summer, um, in your fallow you might use Flame, which has a, a large residual um, in the soil, so Sunblade will cope with those high residual levels of something like uh, flame. So a Mazapic, a Mazapir, those sort of imi, imi chemistries. And it's our first clearfield variety that has an APH classification. So up until now, we've been sort of restricted in clearfield varieties in the northern region to something like Elmore, which is an AH classified variety. Um, and has quite a few limitations if we look at its disease profile. So Sunblade is a clear winner in that clear field space, um, so making a, a big advantage over Elmore. So it's pretty much replaced Elmore overnight. Sunmaster, similar maturity to Sunblade and Suntop. So this is what we're looking at as a replacement for Suntop. So Suntop's been very successful uh, its ability to handle a wide range of conditions, including some sodic soils, um, 
So it's, it's been a very good variety from central Queensland all the way through to Victoria even. So there's growers you know, in a wide range growing for sun top for certain reasons. Sun master is derived from sun top um, with a high yielding parent. So we've made about a sort of a 7% yield advantage over sun top at the moment. Um, with a very similar profile. It is a little bit shorter in plant height than sun top, and so it should stand up under high yielding conditions quite well. Uh, and the, the disease profile is very similar. So there are some advantages there, um, sort of just playing on the margins there, but mostly very similar to sun top. Um, so it should replace varieties like sun top, reliant, um, and even if you push into some of those feed wheat varieties like borlog, so it should push those out as well. And I'd put this one in. We've talked a little bit about catapult being one that's come up from South Australia. So caliber is very similar. I don't know if you know, but scepter has probably been the most widely grown wheat variety in Australia for the last few years. Um, mainly because it dominates through Western Australia and South Australia. So Calibre is the first variety that is derived from SEPTA. So that's come onto the market quite quickly and having good success with it in that region where it's designed for. But we've also included in our trials in the Northern region and in the NVT. And interestingly, uh, after last season, that was the highest yielding variety in the Northern region. So at the moment, we don't have a classification for it in the north. Um, but yeah, we'll certainly keep an eye on it. And if it keeps performing well, it might provide a bit of a left field option. So it doesn't quite have the same disease tolerance that Sunmaster does. Um, but yeah, the yield potential is there. So we'll see how that develops over the next couple of years. Sun Chaser. This is a, a bit of a, a different variety. It's a very well-rounded package in a variety. So um, Mei-Chin was looking for, a, I suppose, a, a bit of an upgrade for Suntop in terms of grain size. So derived from a sister line to Ventura, uh, this variety sort of fits in that maturity window a little bit quicker than Suntop, but it seems to be the complete package, almost. So it's got very good rust resistance. So probably the best of a lot of the material in that planting window. Um, it's also got the longest coleoptile of all of the main season varieties. And it's quite a, a distinct difference between uh, Sun Chaser and varieties like Sun Top. So we do our own coleoptile <coughs> testing at Wagga. Sun Top and Sun Master are very similar, about 100 mil long. Sun Chaser is at 113. So we're getting about a 10% advantage in coleoptile length over a, a good variety like Sun Top and Sun Master. So if you're really looking at that moisture seeking scenario, Sun Chaser provides a lot of options there. And it has probably the best seed size of any of those quicker varieties. So very low risk of high screenings, uh, long coleoptile, really good disease profile means it covers off on a lot of things without any extra input. So it's a very complete package. And I, I see this as a variety that probably gives you a really safe option in a lot of marginal environments. Um, we haven't done a lot of work with it on its sodicity or ability to tolerate sodic soils too much, um, but it's a really good package. The only reason why I wouldn't grow this instead of Sunmaster, that's a, a common question I get, oh, well, should I grow Sunmaster or Sun Chaser? I say, well, it depends on your circumstances. Um, Sunmaster has an advantage over Sun Chaser simply in terms of yield potential. So Sunmaster is the pinnacle in terms of yield performance, whereas Sun Chaser is probably a more sun top, uh, reliant sort of um, yield potential but with a lot of attributes that make it a very useful variety. And another thing that goes with it is that a similar yield, per, yield level to Suntop, uh, it has a higher <coughs> grain protein achievement. So about half to 1% higher protein at the same yield level as Suntop. 
So there's a lot of attributes that go into it. So fairly unique variety, and I think that's one to, to keep an eye on to see if that fits your system. Sun Central sort of getting towards the quicker end. So sister line to Sun Master, but quicker maturity and a, a better seed size. So very similar in a lot of other attributes. So yeah, in that quick maturity, you're looking at comparing it with something like Mustang, uh, Hellfire. So this one will outperform those in, in yield uh, performance, which is what we have here. So we can see in the main season wheat for this northwest New South Wales calibre, just from one year of data, it's sort of right up the top there, just a fraction ahead of Sunblade and Sunmaster. Um, now we've got Vixen in there, which is a, an APH variety from Western Australia, and then Sun Central. So that's four of our varieties of focus in the top five, and they're all ahead of Borlog, which is a feed wheat. Now we've got Reliant, Condamine, Mustang, Sun Prime, sort of that next level down. So those varieties are really challenging that yield ceiling that we've got at the moment and putting a lot of pressure on the other varieties that are out there. Same with our early season, we have a quick look at the disease table. So there's a lot more, you know, variety like gold with a lot of issues with rust. So leaf rust and the stripe rust, yellow leaf spot and nematode tolerance. You'd think, you know, you'd have to have a really good reason to grow a variety like gold. Um, or something like Sun Master, Sun Chaser. We can see Sun Chaser with stripe rust is very solid. RMR, R, MR for stem rust. Anyway, so very solid across there. Same with Sun Master. No great weaknesses there that might bring it back um, in a difficult season. So we have a lot of potential there. And once again, if we look at that crown rot data that we're developing at Sunville, so this is over five years. Sun Top is sort of the benchmark, so we've compared everything to Sun Top, because Sun Top has done very well in crown rot tolerance. So now we're looking at Sun Central and Sun Master being quite a step ahead of Sun Top. And Calibre, although it was the highest yielding in the NVT, once you had a bit of crown rot in there, it drops quite a bit below Sun Master and Sun Central. And Sun Blade, although it's quite similar to Sun Master on that NVT data, uh, not quite as tolerant in crown rot situations as Sun Master is. So there's certainly some advantages there. And Sun Chaser holding a yield level quite similar to Sun Master. And grain side of things, so Spitfire. Um, Dylan, you mentioned there's a bit of Spitfire still being grown, mostly because of its protein achievement. We can see that 14% there. Hellfire at 14.1, so that's quite good. Um, Sun Chase is not too far behind, so at 13 and a half, that sort of gives you a half a percent or so, maybe a percent better than the likes of Sun Master. So grain protein-wise, Sun Chaser is very solid, and with that grain size, it's probably the best in terms of low screenings. So there's a lot to work with there in terms of our wheat varieties. Um, and just looking at that 7% yield advantage for Sunmaster, Sunblade, obviously 11.5% advantage over Elmore. So there's really no reason not to grow Sunblade in that clear field se setting. Sun Central over Spitfire, or if you wanted to compare it to Mustang, it's sort of four, four and a half percent above Mustang. So we've got a lot of options there um, and some really high yielding varieties with a good disease package around it. Durham varieties, do you play with some Durhams out here every now and then? No? I know um, James Carl at Wee War, he grows a little bit of Durham up there. Um, and he's certainly a, a convert to Westcourt, and it's certainly at the moment the dominant um, Durham variety. Uh, I've got a grower up at John Darien. He was very happy with Westcourt, and particularly when he locked in a contract at $690 a tonne, uh, he was extremely happy with that. 
Um, I won't say you'd get that every year, but uh, certainly last year it, it went a long way to, to um, paying a lot of bills for him, which was very nice. So Westcourt, one of the main attributes for Westcourt is its high yield. So it's probably the highest yielding Durham variety at the moment. And also a lot of the Tamworth Durhams have dropped back in their stripe rust rating to an MS, whereas Westcourt has maintained an MR rating to stripe rust. So it's probably one of the few varieties that has that capability to, to cope with stripe rust at the moment. So yield-wise, we can see Westcourt right up the top there. Aurora is a southern variety, um, so we don't see a lot of that up here. Um, mainly through high screenings. Um, once you get high screenings in Durham, you drop out of that DR1 classification, you take a bit of a hit. Um, Artemis is another southern variety, Batali's a southern variety of ours. Mataroy is the new one out of the Tamworth Durham program, so that's just a little way back in that um, yield potential there. So Westcourt, that's probably the main reasons it's really Uh, yes, we've incorporated all the, the material from the Tamworth program into our program, and Tom's evaluating that, including the University of Adelaide material in that as well. So we've got a lot of new material in there that we're evaluating. Uh, so Mataroy will be the last um, that's come out of the Tamworth Durham program under that structure. Disease ratings. Um, just put a blanket circle over crown rot for, for Durham's absolute suckers. Um, and there's not much we can do about that at the moment. Uh, so as I said, with stripe rust, we've got Westcourt, Artemis, which is a southern variety, and Mataroy. So there's sort of two options that can cope with stripe rust at the moment, Westcourt and Mataroy. And Westcourt sort of got the yield, yield covered for, for Mataroy for the moment. Grain quality data, um, sort of Westcourt, very large seed size, so it's doing particularly well in there. So, yeah, a lot to like about Westcourt, and that's a reason that a lot of growers that are growing Durham are very happy with it. If we move on to our barley varieties, Beast was released a couple of seasons ago. It's a compass type, but it's quite quick and quite tall, um, and it's real area of fit is in that low yielding environment. Sort of under that two and a half tonnes to the hectare, uh, beast really performs very nicely. Once we get into that high yield potential, so for last year where we're looking at sort of five, six tonnes to the hectare, um, beast and other compass types really suffer due to lodging. So they tend to fall over quite easily. They produce a lot of biomass. Uh, their grain size is very good but they do fall over very easily. So last year we released Yeti. So that's our, our new variety on the block. It's a little bit unique. Most of the barley varieties have a fit all the way around the country. Uh, whereas we saw with Yeti um, that in the northern region, it had a much better performance than elsewhere. So we've essentially released Yeti for this environment. So from Dubbo North, uh, it is a high yielding variety. It's another compass type, but a little bit shorter and with better lodging tolerance. So where we see um, sort of beast and compass and Leebrook falling over, Yeti will stand up a bit better. Um, so it's probably a little bit more towards the planet and Spartacus side of things in terms of plant height and also ability to handle lodging situations. So really large seed size again with this one. So it's certainly kicking a lot of goals in that northern region. So if we look at the yield performance, 2019 where it was a dry year, Yeti performed extremely well. So we can see Beast did well in that dry environment too. Uh, so did Compass and Spartacus. So they're four varieties that in that dry season really capitalized and a variety like Planet dropped right back. In a sort of the last two seasons where it's a bit, bit wetter, higher yield performance, not quite as much uh, for these compass types because they started to really fall off, but planet does well 
in those really high yield environments. So if you're looking for a you know, high yield environment year after year, Planet will certainly do very well. Uh, but if you've got something that you need to do well in a tough environment and a high yield environment, then I think Yeti is probably a very good choice. So disease ratings, um, all of the Bali's really struggle with foliar diseases. So it's a bit hard to put red circles on there for weaknesses because there's just a smattering of red everywhere. So just a couple of key attributes where varieties are doing well. Laparus and Yeti both do quite well in the spot form of net blotch. Um, so looking at that MR rating, MRMS, and Rosalind does well in the net form of net blotch. So there's a few areas there where you might take advantage, but basically barleys, you probably want to put a fungicide on anyway. So most of those fungicides will cover a, a fair spectrum of those foliar diseases for you. Grain quality, so we're looking at the compass types. So beast with high retention, um, Laparus, not too bad. Leebrook is very similar to Beast. And Yeti, once again, large seed size. So that certainly helps um, maintaining that yield. Mentioned briefly about coleoptile length. This is a useful bit of information. So we can see in those quick mid and quick spring varieties, Sun Chaser is right up the top. Calibre is pretty good. So that's sort of in the south and west, they're looking at Calibre as a, a long coleoptile version of Scepter. Um, so that's right up the top there. And then there's a bit of a gap to the likes of Elmore and Hellfire. And then Sun Central, Spitfire, Cuda, Sun Master, all about that 100. Uh, sun Top at 99. So we can see there's a reasonable advantage. There is some longer coleoptile material in our breeding program. That's going to take a few more years before something might flow through uh, out the back end, but when we're looking at that one attribute, say that long coleoptile, we might have to sacrifice something else to get up to around that 140 mil. So, you know, what's it worth to you? That's the question. And that's something for Mei Chin to, to ponder at night. How much emphasis do I put on a long coleoptile? What do I have to sacrifice to keep that in there? So it's a, a quite a, an interesting balancing act, trying to get the, all those attributes right. Slow spring wheat, Sunflex 95, Cuda 94, you know, very good. Um, a little bit of an advantage over Lancer. And then you've got your, your Gregory types, Kula, Gregory, Flanker, all around that 87 to 90. So there's a little bit of an advantage there. Um, so if you're sowing early and you want to get the best out of your moisture seeking, then Sunflex and Kuta are two very good options. Barley varieties. Um, Barley has really good sort of emergence properties, and a lot of that is due to its first leaf. But the coleoptile lengths, not a lot of difference. Yeti's quite good at 88. Um, Minotaur, Fathom, Commander, Laparu, sort of up around there. So not a lot of difference there. Um, and Yeti will probably certainly sort of be as good as anything else in terms of emergence and establishment. So Durham and Barley. Um, obviously Yeti over Planet, we're looking at about a 5% advantage in the northern region. Um, Durham, Westcourt over the other leading variety up until now, Lillaroy, we're looking at almost a 12% advantage over Lillaroy. So if we can sort of capitalise on those yield advantages, uh, it makes a real difference to your bottom line. So what's new in breeding within AGT? We'll see if we can wrap this up reasonably quickly because they're starting the barbecue, so we don't want to miss out. Obviously, I, I mentioned quickly coaxia magressa barley. So that's some new technology to the, to the barley uh, sphere. Uh, it's an Australian first, and I think a world first, actually, in terms of developing that technology. So we've got the Clearfield system, so the wheat and barley, and also we've got canola varieties that can cope with those IMI herbicides. Um, our AGTB325 is able to cope with um, a group A or group one uh, herbicide called Aggressor. 
Um, so that's the, the one that it will be sort of registered with. So aggressor is a quizalifop, so a QPE is the active ingredient. So which means that we will be able to do some grass weed control in crop with our barley variety. So we can spray that with aggressor and not have any sort of detrimental impact. And we're actually doing a demo at Sunville when it dries out. Uh, we might be able to plant that, um, but at the moment it's too wet. So yeah, we'll, we'll certainly investigate that this season um, and that will be released. So farmers will be able to get hold of some seed of that next season. Probably focusing a bit more on the southern regions um, and Western Australia than the northern region because we we'll probably have a, a bit more option in the north with our summer crop program as to how we handle some of our grass weed. Canola, uh, as I mentioned, we've got a couple of varieties. So we've got a conventional and two triazine tolerant varieties coming through. They will be a little bit different. Obviously, they're not hybrids. Um, and canola is sort of pushing a little bit further north each year. We've got a, a lot more canola in this part of the world than we had a few years ago. Open pollinated varieties, seed will be accessible next year. So if you're interested in that, um, yeah, we're actually developing a bit of a portal where you can actually register your interest for that. And we're developing a bit of a dis distribution model to try and get seed to farmers, which will be a little bit different to our affiliate model at the moment. So there are a couple of varieties to keep, a, keep an eye on. Bear in mind, they're not hybrids, so they're not gonna achieve that same level of yield as hybrid varieties do. Um, so you might take a little bit of a yield deficit, but obviously the cost of getting into a, an OP variety is a lot less than it is in purchasing seed of a hybrid variety. And if you purchase it for next year, or you have some seed next year, and you harvest it, you can keep that seed and that variety will maintain its performance year after year for you, for you on farm. So that's a yield performance. Uh, probably around about that 10% sort of in that ballpark. So yeah, it's certainly competitive. When you look at the gross margins in a low yielding environment, um, it yeah, stacks up quite nicely. Yeah, so there's certainly some good options there. Beg your pardon? For these, uh, to you, nothing. <laughs> so we're developing a new model for that one. And because these are our first varieties getting out there, um, we are looking at providing seed to growers. So that's why we're getting people to register their interest in those varieties. Um, so AGT is going to cover the cost of that seed. And yeah, yeah, essentially. So because AGT is in its 20th anniversary year, we are looking to sort of give something back to the community. Um, so we've done a number of presentations to local groups where we've presented uh, checks of $20,000 like to North Star to help them build a, a childcare area in their, in their club. So this is part of that process. We're actually giving back to the community. So uh, this will be something a little bit different. So obviously AGT will make some proper announcements about that later. Um, but yeah, this is something that's a little bit different for us. So yeah, so at the moment, if, if you can get seed for free, then certainly getting into a new variety is a very low cost. Triticale, so yeah, something a little bit different. Um, it's not something we deal with a lot up here, but it's probably more for grazing uh, forage production. Um, it is a variety that copes with those sodic soils reasonably well. Um, so we have a couple of varieties, Astute and Bison, that are on the market. Um, they're available from one of our affiliates further south, either Bakers or Hart Brothers. Um, so they're, they're something that sort of goes along with our other cereal production. Uh, it's not as competitive because there's probably not as many options for the grain that we have with our bread wheats. Um, so they're probably a little bit limited in end use, uh, but the yield performance for them can be quite good. And something that 
in a tricky sodic soil situation might provide some benefit to you. So, you know, they're, they're an option and we can certainly make those varieties available to you. So available through our, our affiliate network. Lupins, very quickly. So coyote is a variety that's released mainly for WA. Um, certainly a very different looking crop for up here. Uh, if you can make use of it to break up some compaction, uh, that might be of benefit, but uh, how it copes with our soils, it's not something we traditionally see up here. So it's something that you might want to have a look at, talk to our farmer at Wee War and see how he gets on this year. Um, but certainly not something that is a traditional crop for this part of the world. So, yeah. Yeah, you used to grow a lot of lupins? Hmm. Yeah, it's certainly not a crop that I've had much experience with at all. So, I've I've never actually seen a lupin trial, to tell you the truth. Yeah. So. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So these are a little bit different. Obviously, a, a narrow leaf lupin. So the other option would be an albus lupin. So there's a couple of different um, species that go side by side for different endpoint uh, uses. Yeah, so we have coyote and we have a new variety, AGT P006, that we're releasing later this year. So um, yeah, the, for next season, there'll be a couple of options. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do with that in the near future. And then just to finish off, a few pretty pictures of some of our varieties that we've released. Obviously, Sunflex, Cooter, Sunblade, Sunmaster, and a blank slide, Sun Central, Beast, and Yeti. <laughs>